Paint Your Heart Out, a guide to inspired art making by Katerina Edwards. Introduction. I have spent years exacting my painting craft, figuring out the nuts and bolts of what makes good art, art. I've spent countless hours in classes, studios, art schools, critiques, and galleries, and the one concept that others seem to have had a hard time paint, pinning down is inspiration. Artists, sad and deflated without it, cry, I'm just not into this. Poets, dancers, and filmmakers without it abandon their crafts to the wastelands of daily life and dream of better days when they had it, and all their work came easily. What is it? Uh, inspiration, of course. Some feel it is a fleeting beast, one that is wily, tricky, and seems to have a mind of its own. Some say it comes in waves. Some even feel that it is at the whim of a capricious god that they do or do not have it. Whatever bestows it, it is certainly outside of their control. A rather gloomy thought, I say. Well, what if I told you that this is not the case? That you have the ability to tap into this infinite wellspring of creativity and ideas anytime you choose that the time didn't have to be right, and that you can create with whatever you have, wherever you are. That you can also make powerfully inspired art that seemingly came out of nowhere. If that sounds good to you, then this book is for you. If you are tired of operating in bits and spurts of inspiration, waiting for all the cards to line up, and the creativity gods to don you your next book or painting idea, stay with me till the end. You won't regret it. Chapter 1 the basic premises of inspired art. Have you ever sat down at your desk and written a really mean letter to someone that you were frustrated with? How about a love letter to that guy you couldn't stop crushing on? Ever draw a boss with a snaggle tooth or getting hit by a bus? Too risque, perhaps? Oh, no, I would never do that. I'm a nice person. You know, kids are really good at expressing themselves. They would do that stuff. Just take a look at a child's coloring book the next time you're around them. They have no qualms about showing up on the page, meaning they have no issue with letting their heart's true expressions out on the paper in front of them. Coloring book pages are filled with doodles and scribbles outside the lines, almost like they are additions to the story already taking place. I think Prince Charming is so nice. He reminds me of my daddy. Or... That evil witch is so mean, she reminds me of my cousin. Small stick figure depictions illustrate the feelings of the little one. Fiery sparks sprang from her cousin's mouth. To the civilized and adult among us, kid storytelling on paper doesn't really make sense, and if it does, we just think it to be cute and don't really give it any further thought to the fact that they just showed us a glimpse into their inner world. Along the way, we started to grow up. No longer were pictures of Shark Sister or Witch Cousin or Prince Charming necessary to communicate our feelings. So most of us stopped the doodles and took to other means of expression, and in some instances, repression. The fear of your having your true feelings be known and understood was threatening, so you stopped making them visible. Maybe you were found out one time, and you became afraid that someone would tattle on you again. Whatever has happened to you in that regard, it is important to recognize it. The heart of inspired art. The heart of inspired art making lies within you, within your core self. It's that place that you frequented as a child, the place where anything seemed to go. Zebras were pink and the sky was green and you could make anyone disappear just by scribbling out their face. This is where the place of freedom, power and creation the childlike place where you go to create your inner world on the page, and it was so. Many of us feel out of control in our own lives, and one of the first things that goes that would make all the difference is our chosen art craft. We putz around, toing and froing to work, to obligatory social gatherings, trying to pay our bills, raise a family, and live a normal life. We do our best to not rock the boat, not to upset others, and not to alarm anyone about the fact that we are dying a creative death inside. Life isn't exciting, as, and we don't know any more what would excite us. In the deepest sense, we are blocked. 
the possibility of more. The act of creating changes our consciousness. When pen is on paper, we are open, receptive, and welcoming of new ideas, solutions, and answers to the quandaries of life. Many a problem have I solved by engaging my creative kiddo to give me a new perspective. And that is the most threatening thing there is to a blocked creative, a simple solution. We rear, buck, and resist the possibility of leaving the sheltered harbor of sameness and depression and trick ourselves into thinking that it will be too hard, too challenging, and that we've lost our gift due to years of neglect. This simply isn't so. Art changes us, and when we really pour our hearts into it, it can heal us as well. By allowing ourselves to unfurl, to expand, to retract, and to unleash ourselves on the page, we begin to recollect the pieces of ourselves we lost along the way. Shamans call this soul retrieval, and in a sense, art is doing that. It's excavating the ruins of your mind and coming up with the treasures, the jewels, and the ancient artifacts of your past self, and allowing you to relearn who you are and what it means for you today. Art is the process of learning to tap back into your heart and express what comes from it. This can be an easy, medium, or difficult journey, depending on your level of blockage but it is doable and achievable. The methods and ideas I share in the next chapters speak to this, and I wish you tremendous love for your journey back to yourself. The basic premises of inspired art. Art is a way to self-discovery. Any emotions, feelings, or troubles you have will surface. The only way out of your troubles is through them. Art is a way of healing latent emotions and thus disease. Joy, fulfillment, and peace are attainable through the application of inspired art principles. Chapter two, getting out of the way. Have you ever been working on a project that you had tons of enthusiasm for, and then almost as if a swarm of bees came racing around you, the negative thoughts started buzzing in your mind? Posing themselves to be, poising themselves to be, to sting your progress and to take you under. Been there? Me too. Our self-criticisms keep us from allowing our creative essences to flow and to flourish. You're no good, the internal oppressive voice exclaims. That's rotten work. Better stop before someone actually sees it. They hum and haw, and then all of a sudden, you just don't want to keep going anymore. You're tired of even trying, and perhaps you now want to distract yourself from the painful blows to your inner artist. Perhaps you go and distract yourself with food, internet surfing, alcohol, procrastination, or gossip. Whatever it is, it numbs the stinging sensation of worthlessness. Adopting external criticism as your own voice. A story that comes to mind about my own internal critics, how, about how my own internal critics came to be. I was at a portfolio day at the Emily Carr Institute in Vancouver, BC, and I was looking for some feedback on my artwork from the professors before I decided to apply to their college. I waited around for four hours after a grueling six hour drive north from Portland, Oregon, and elbowing my way into a stuffy and packed hallway lines full of hopeful high school students. Exercise, where did your internal oppressors come from? school, parents, siblings, grandparents, explore their origin. Then imagine the strongest version of yourself going back in time and telling the person off. Have fun with it, draw it, imagine it. Live the victory of standing up for your right to creativity on your terms. When it was finally my turn for a, tr a critique, I was met by a stodgy British man with a, British, with a really bad attitude. He groaned as he looked at my work, feeling less than enthralled with my precious art. This is too stiff. You need more movement, more variety. Next. Wide-eyed, I looked at him. How could he have been so dismissive of the work that I had poured myself into for the past few years? No compliments, no approbation, one comment, and he's done? I walked out of the room, head hung low, and felt as though that there was no use in it. Why bother? I'd met my first critic in a high place, and he essentially told me that I was no good. Boy, was that some good fodder for my internal oppressor. I didn't create anything for a few months after that. I didn't have the coping ability to handle the criticisms. 
I especially didn't have the capacity to handle the black clouds of ruthless judgments that hung around my head many months later. This chapter is all about overcoming those voices, whether they be internal or external. That experience helped me grow because I learned to be more protective of myself and discerning of the opinions of others. The Gatekeepers of Inspiration It is important to know that if you are wanting to create inspired artwork, you need to learn how to deal with the mean, nasty, oppressive gatekeepers. They are standing there, blocking you off from the entrance into the lands of creativity and the wellspring of ideas to draw from. Imagine tall, scaly lizard men hissing at you, telling you that you don't have any business accessing the land of creativity because you aren't a true artist. What are you going to do? Fight back, I hope. Once you defeat the oppressors, you will have access to the lavish and beautiful gardens of creativity land, and you will be able to drink freely the waters of the idea wellspring. It's worth learning to how to defeat the voices, right? The way to access this wellspring is to not be put off by the oppressors and to allow yourself to keep going. Toughen up your armor of self-worth and know that you are worthy of access to creativity land. You can use a really awesome ninja Jedi trick too. Question, what are they saying? Is it true? If the oppressive voices tell you that you're never going to be a good artist, ask them, is that true? They may point at your current work and tell you, of course it's true, just look at what you were making right there. Exercise. What are your lizard men hissing at you? What cruel and painful judgments do you have about yourself that are making it hard for you to access creativity land and drink from the wellspring of ideas? List them on paper and ask yourself if they are true. Look for evidence to the contrary. What would it feel like if you defeated the lizard men and got complete access to creativity land you've been wanting? What would it be like to access inspiration? Meditate on your answer for a few moments before proceeding. It is Ask if it is absolutely true. They may stumble a bit and squirm for a yes, but they can't know it's absolutely true because they can't predict the future any more than I can. The future is just a string of todays, and the more todays you practice and don't let the lizard men oppressors win, you are closer to becoming the kind of artist you want to be. But if you don't question them, they will always win. The voices will appear, but it's your job to be louder than the voices and disprove the thoughts. See where I'm going with this? In fact, you can use a process of inquiry with just about any stressful thought. You ask and discover the truth of the matter. You listen for evidence contrary to the original thought and be amazed. Things are not always as they seem, especially when it comes to beliefs we hold about ourselves. Are you thinking to yourself, Oh, but I don't have any negative thoughts about myself or my art. I just want to learn about inspired art making, Katarina. Well, then I have a special exercise for you and for everyone else. Really, because this is an amazing practice in general. I've been doing this for three years now. Get yourself a notebook and practice automatic writing for 14 days every morning. Write three pages longhand in their entirety of stream of consciousness words and sentences, meaning whatever comes to mind. Don't stop, just keep going. It's 99% likely that you will eventually come upon a negative or resistant thought. And when you do, you get a chance to observe it and to keep writing. And if it's a particularly stressful thought, apply the exercise and keep going. The uh, is it true exercise. Quick recap. Our self-criticisms keep us from allowing our creative essences to flow and to flourish. The way to access this wellspring is to not be put off by the internal voice and allow yourself to keep going. Practicing automatic writing is an excellent way of skating past your internal critic. The voice will appear, but it's your job to be louder than the voice and to, to disprove the thoughts. Inquire, where did these original thoughts come from? Why do you keep them around? How are the negative and critical voices serving you? And what would it be like if you didn't have these thoughts? Chapter three, approaching old work.
Project Graveyard. Maybe it's the attic, your garage, the shed, under your bed, in a cabinet, somewhere on your hard drive, or the spare bedroom. We all have that resting place for our dead projects. I affectionately call it the Project Graveyard for obvious reasons. When a piece just isn't working out and we don't have the desire to finish it, it gets buried. With the piece of work, we bury our dreams for it. We resign it to a pile of not quite there and promptly forget about it. We've lost steam and thus hope. When I lived in Portland, I had a huge stack of paintings that I never touched again. I had let too much time pass me by and the initial excitement had vanished. And so all I had was half-born creations that I didn't feel like investing any t more time in because I didn't know how they could possibly resolve. I just wanted it to go away. So I stuck my perceived failure in a pile and kept going. The most interesting thing was that my artwork started going stale. Everything I was doing didn't really turn out and the stuff that I did felt mediocre and not as I wanted it to be. Continuing to add to the project graveyard was depressing me, so eventually I made a change. I was going to rescue zombies from the graveyard. At first, it felt kind of weird, almost like it wasn't the original intent of the painting, but I got past that feeling and realized that the work I was doing could stand on its own as new work, and I didn't need it to be compared to the original idea. My paintings turned into hybrids, into centaurs, and into the most outlandish sites I'd created, and it was awesome. By releasing that comparison to what I thought it should be, my current perspectives and feelings were able to instruct the painting in a new direction, one that was more creative and different than I had previously thought of. The resurrection of your dead product, projects. If you also have a project graveyard that you want to resurrect, I have some ideas for you that have worked for me in doing so. One, if you have a project that you haven't looked at for a while, bring it out and place it in a site for you to notice during your daily activities. Perhaps the mantle of your fireplace, a table, a windowsill, your desktop. Number two, when you pass it by it, tinker with an idea, a change, a possible amendment. Play with the possibilities of what could be done. You don't need to do it right then, but think, what if I did this? Number three, when you get a wild hair idea, go play with it and see where it takes you. There's no harm, no foul if you don't like it because you already put it in the graveyard once. Keep playing with it and when you get an inkling, keep your eye your focus on play and experimentation. Otherwise, it's easy to get caught up in what's wrong with it or what needs fixing. It's evolving, so let it go through its stages. Chapter four, starting on a fresh work. A blank canvas is a beautiful thing. There are so many possibilities and potentials for you to create. What are you going to do? Where are you going to take it? It's like a metaphor for a blank slate in life. The creation is up to you, and something about that is exhilarating and also terrifying. Setting an intention. It is helpful to set an intention for the work you are beginning. Sometimes the blank, the blank white space can overwhelm us and we feel lost, almost like, what am I doing here? What do I do now? The intention does not need to be concrete, but it is a good idea to get a feeling for what you want to do. Broad strokes and squiggles are awesome if you're wanting a stream of consciousness paint, uh, if you want to stream of consciousness paint something, but that's not what we're addressing here. Ask yourself, what is its purpose? Who is it for? What do you want it to say? Jot or draw your ideas and summon the feelings of the finished piece. You don't have to know what it will look like, but you can tap into how you want it to feel. Meditate on the feeling of the finished work. Is it light, airy, or dreamy? Is it dark, shadowy, or brooding? How about sexy, seductive, or erotic? Is it quirky and whimsical? When you decide on the mood, do your best to conjure the feeling place of your intended artwork. I have a friend who is a writer, and when she is doing research for a character of a new story, she likes to go to places for inspiration that her character would go. 
She would do her best to embody their consciousness, think like them, talk like them, and be them. I wouldn't put it past her to go to a strip club and soak in the atmosphere if that was what was needed for the pimp character in her book. The experiences and nuances of interaction you observe can instruct your brushes strokes, your dialogues, looks on that portrait's face, and the overall feeling of your work. A few things I like to do to prepare, to prepare for my paintings. It's almost like setting the mood for a romantic evening for myself. I light candles. I set my intention to be a conduit for spirit. I light incense and fill my senses with the scent that smells like what I want to create, like rose for romance, lavender for peace and calm, etc. I choose the music accordingly. Note, for more ethereal paintings, I turn on some Enya, Alluvium, ambient or chill step music. For sad or melancholy art, I'll turn on Death Cab for Cutie, Metric, Goo Goo Dolls, or Radiohead. The music keeps the mood and inspiration steady, and I find that I get a painting done more quickly when I work with music as well. It's harder to hear critical voices, and also uh, I become entrained with the music. My brain goes into alpha state easier and have a deeper experience of flow. Another preparation I like to do is dance, particularly for inspirational paintings. I love to conjure excitement, energy, and passion with dance music beforehand. It puts me in a really good place mentally, and it also pumps me up with enthusiasm to finish. Consciousness creates. Some find it helpful to turn on music of a similar feeling, or set the atmosphere around themselves to reflect the feeling, or go somewhere that represents that feeling to themselves and soak in the inspiration. Look for things you could use in your work. Reminisce on times past that reminded you of this piece. Do whatever you can to embody the feelings. The reason I really emphasize the importance of setting the mood and, and mentally going there is because your consciousness is what creates. It's important for your consciousness to be with the finished piece. Otherwise, you will not get there. It's pretty difficult to paint a happy painting when you're feeling sad and vice versa. So know what you are going for and be okay with it. Did you know that I painted one of my more popular paintings, Ecstasy, in less than six hours by implementing these strategies? I was feeling kind of down one day and I was just surfing Facebook and noticed a really cool picture of my friend Hannah flipping her hair into a spiral out at the river. I was overcome by the beauty of this. I turned on some ecstatic dancing music and I got to drawing. I transferred the drawing to a four foot by four foot canvas below uh, and I started really, it really started shaping up. The vision for the painting was born in my heart and the movement and the energy and pop. I did my best to support that vision by dancing, making broad strokes on the canvas and working large. I was so elated while I was doing all of it because I had the intention for the energy I wanted to create in the artwork. You can do this too, as it's incredibly effective and the paintings that come this way are soulful, bold, expressive, and heartfelt. Allowing your soul to spill out onto the canvas is so satisfying, so rewarding of an experience. The heart leads the wrist, the brush strokes, and the composition, almost like the brain wasn't even involved at all. If you aren't having incredible emotion when creating, I think it's time to look at your intentions for creating. Remember, ask yourself, what is its purpose? Who is it for? What do you want it to say? Jot or draw, uh, jot or draw your ideas and summon the feelings of the finished piece. You don't have to know what it will look like, but you can tap into how you want it to feel. Meditate on the feeling of the finished work. Is it light, airy, or dreamy? Is it dark, shadowy, and brooding? How about sexy, perspective, or erotic? Quirky and whimsical? Decide on the mood and do your best to conjure the feeling place of your intended work. Chapter 5. Staying with it till the finish line. In the last chapter, we discussed that consciousness creates, so that is why it is vitally important that you do everything you can to finish the work promptly while your enthusiasm is still around and just get it done. Over time, your consciousness fluctuates and you can lose steam on a project by not acting on it. Art is born of action and execution. 
The setup and conjuring must be done to make the work be inspired. If not acting on inspiration as your rocket fuel, you may struggle with little dribbles of inspiration, drill sergeant tactics, or just putz along and add another half-done piece to your project graveyard. As I also mentioned in the last chapter, I have had many encounters with giving up before I finish. It left me feeling down, and like I couldn't really get to where I wanted to go. Success begets success. Half-finished projects diminish your morale, and if you have a habit of not finishing what you start, you will end up losing your confidence in your ability to create. Develop a yes-I-can attitude by starting small and working to completion. There is an exhilarating feeling in accomplishing the work you set out to do, and that builds your confidence as a creator and allows you to keep expanding within your craft. And if the voices of self-doubt and criticism come back, remember to question them and ask if they are true. Most of the time they are not, and they are just there to keep you from finishing. A bit of a self-sabotage maneuver, especially if you haven't been creating much lately, or if you've been getting stymied by the voices and then have started to overcome them. As a final hurrah, they may try to pop up or try to pop back in and distract you from finishing and then make you frustrated with yourself for not finishing. It's a negative spiral downwards and I hope you now have the tools to sidestep that. I feel it important to remind you that though the scaly lizard men are, are persistent at times, and they don't want you to win, it's so important to guard your mental space. As we start moving ahead on projects, there is a tendency to share our triumphs with people. Like a child bringing home their a report card, we just want to show off and receive validation. A word of caution and discretion is vital here. Share with supportive people only. Share with people that will support and love your efforts towards inspired art making. Keep tight lips around known critics, for they may give you damaging feedback on your fledgling piece that is still incubating. Avoid sharing with these people and you avoid the possibility of hatching a stillborn. When you share with supportive people, open yourself up. You open yourself up to helpful suggestions, love and encouragement. Please do this. It will be helpful to you and encourage you to keep going. You can find a kind friend who gets it support circles out there for artists, or you can join my support circle at facebook.com forward slash artist dot support dot circle. Chapter six, the finished piece. Congratulations, you now understand what it takes to make inspired artwork. While riding that wave of inspiration, you probably discovered a lot more about yourself and, that, and are that much better at expressing yourself to the outside world. That's fantastic. When you finish a piece, remember that it is an expression of the place you were at that moment in time. It's important that you never criticize your work, place judgment on it, or minimize it or yourself in any way. Allow yourself to celebrate the achievement of your finished work and relish in its finer points. Ask yourself, did I enjoy thoroughly working on this piece? Would working in a different medium expand or contract my sense of wonder and excitement? What does this work reveal to me about myself and my deeper desires? What action steps can I take to get closer to the visions and dreams I depict in my work? What do I need to rid my life of to get closer to my heart's desires? Meditate on your answers. Write them down. This is guidance from your spirit and it would serve you to keep your ears perked and listen for the invaluable treasures our soul wants to share. Art is such an incredible way of getting feedback on your internal world and really peering deep into the complexity and nuances that you are. By engaging in inspired art making and fostering the habit of introspection and communion with yourself on the canvas, you are advancing on a spiritual journey, whether you realize it or not. I share in the afterward portion of this book about my own journey with art as a way to spirituality, healing, and joy. I invite you to read on if you are so inclined. Afterward, my paint your heart out story. Art has always been a way to explore my humanity. Through intimate excavation, I faced the depths of the horrors lying in the far corners of my mind, the effervescent dreamy highs that captivate me and make 
my heart feel like it will burst forth from my chest from all the love it's outpouring and everything in between. There is courage in the act of facing yourself on the page in the fact that you are unable to hide from your truth. Every mark and paint stroke can provide you that feedback about yourself and your inner world. Art making for me as a journey in self-discovery, a way to self-knowledge. I find that this honesty and truth I share in my art extends to those that see my work and it inspires that inner connection side of them as well. Art is inherently a spiritual undertaking, and that's the main reason I have such passion and zeal for my practice. It began as a therapeutic approach to deal with the years of frustration I experienced as a child with many, many years of family mis misfortune. I had a mentally ill family member that was highly disruptive and challenging, so I started drawing as a way to cope and process through my own feelings that would otherwise go unexpressed due to the, volatil the nature of their volatility and my fear of it. It was an escape from the chaos and a way to engage my imagination in a way that created a sense of safety and peace in my unstable environment. Years passed and my health took a turn for the worst. I became very ill and most of the time was homebound. During that time, I had a lot of availability for introspection and I found the fuel for my artistic vision and deepened my relationship to the internal world. I used art as a way to express the rage and pain that felt so smothering and toxic, as well as the hopes and dreams for a brighter tomorrow. In a weakened state, I felt so disempowered and so ineffectual, but my art gave me the means to state myself loud and clear. Art and expression is power, giving a voice to the meek and strength to the feeble. I used my notebook as a way to work through the psychological and challenges of being ill with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and a host of autoimmune disorders. I used the page to pour out the painful and heart-wrenching self-loathing I had acquired from childhood and years of battling anorexia and discovered my life, my, 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 a relief from my deep depression and a hope to keep moving forward. Eventually, I discovered my encourager voice, and that internal cheerleader guided me to keep pressing on, even when I felt horrible and like I wanted to give up entirely. The process of journaling and drawing taught me about practicing self-forgiveness and releasing perfectionism. I'm quite fortunate to have regained my health, and also fortunate to have gained in the insights, wisdom, and awareness that such an experience opened me to. All of it has impacted my art in a multitude of ways, from my interests in cosmology, nature, holistic health, meditation, and spirituality, and other big picture concepts of the world, to the way I think and relate to myself, circumstances, and the people in my life, as well as relationships I have with my future, and the confidence I have in my ability to use my skills and ideas in a contributive way. My hopes for you going forward. Thank you for engaging in the journey to inspired art making with me through reading this book. I hope that you are better prepared to engage on your own process of self-healing and discovery through art. Take the gift of art forward with you and use it to its full potential of being a heart-healing, self-discovering, juicy, and liberating tool to help you live the way that you were meant to live, fully and deeply engaged with life and your place in it. I hope that you learn to overcome your fears of unleashing yourself on the page and truly letting your radiance and beauty shine through every brushstroke, every word, and every emotion that you feel. This is embarking upon, this is the embarking upon of a grand journey, one where you may face many of your own demons and monsters, though you now know that you can expose them for the lies they are and triumph in your recovery. Best wishes to you in uncovering that beautiful, radiant, and brilliant light within you. And when you do, share it with others, for you may help them too. If this book has helped you in any way, please pass it on. Tell others about Paint Your Heart Out. About the author, Katerina Edwards. 
Katerina is an artist and empowerment coach. She lives in a, her a hermetic introspective life in the mountainside home of Costa Rica with her creative husband, Paul, and together the two of them are dedicated to sharing their insights and inspiration with the world online. They also love traveling and are often found bopping around the Americas. She is a writer, a painter, primarily acrylic, and also an illustrator. To view her works, please visit her gallery page. Her self-empowerment coaching is geared towards creatives who are blocked in their work and lives and guides them to, into a brighter, fuller, joyful, and more expressed lives they've been wanting for themselves. Blessed with the gift of seeing through bullshit, she helps you unravel from the web of lies and doubts you've been choking your creative spirit with. She cuts to the core of the issue, gives clarity and insight, and a clear roadmap to the solution. Please visit her sessions offering page to see if a coaching session with her is what you are needing. Katerina and Paul also hold personal retreats for those who would like to experience Costa Rica and spend time learning and exploring with them. They facilitate artist, meditation, and adventure retreats depending on the season. For more information, click here. Alongside her work as a coach and an artist, she also volunteers her time as a teacher to exploited girls ages 11 to 17, sharing the gift of creative expression as therapy, passing on the blessing of art to these emotionally shut down girls. The organization she volunteers for is Seeds of Hope, and you can follow the link to visit their website. If you'd like your own complete copy of Paint Your Heart Out, you can head over to katerineedwards.com forward slash paint your heart out and get yours today. It's on sale for $9.99. Originally it was $19.95, but I just really want to get this in the hands of as many artists and fledgling creatives who are wanting this and who could really benefit from this information. So if you know anybody, please forward them to that or please share with them this video. Uh, I would be really, really appreciative and it would just really help a lot more people. So thank you so much for listening to Paint Your Heart Out, the audiobook version. And if you would like any more information on me, Katerina Edwards, uh, you can go over to my website, katerinaedwards.com. Thanks everyone.